Hello world, I am Norman Rafferty and I work for Sanguine Games. We had a couple of glitches, even though we had a test before this started, so naturally there are last minute glitches, but we are started. We are happy to see you today. Uh, I am joined today by Griffin. Uh, Griffin, can you be heard? Yes, I can. Hey, how are you doing, everybody? Excellent. Uh, Griffin is going to be my co-pilot for this. Uh, you may not recognize himself and myself from many streams here on Ractus TV, uh, where we go ahead and stream many of our games, including Iron Claw and some of the other games made by Sanguine Games. So we're going to be watching, keep one eye on, on the display and one eye on you. So if you've got questions, let us know. This presentation is about two hours long. I'm not going to give the whole presentation, uh, just bits of it that are relevant to you. I'm assuming that you came here because you want to go ahead and self-publish something, a book, a box game, something like that. Uh, so I've got way more slides here that we're going to go ahead and tailor to your presentation. Sometimes you might ask a question that comes up a bit later, so when uh, we'll ask for that later. But if you've got questions, feel free to put them in the chat. There will be a slight delay when your question comes up when it gets to me, but Griffin and I will be fielding it. Plus also, there'll be links in the presentation. Griffin's going to go ahead and drop those links in the text chat if you want to see those. But they'll also be here. So we're happy to have folks today. I hope everybody's good today, right? Okay, and double check. We're still running? Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, I lost my camera, but that's YouTube. okay. First presentation, Google Sheets. Okay, so let's go. Okay, once again, uh, we'll be posting text in the chat. Normally, I do this in a big presentation, so in a big slideshow, so you can ignore the QR codes, or if you have your phone handy, use them. It's up to you. Okay, so basically, what your goal is, if you're going to go ahead and make your thing, there's some fundamental things that are true about whatever you want to make. If it's a box game, role-playing game, video game, graphic novel, what have you, the important thing is we want to be smart about it. We're going to have to be very specific to decide what it is that we want to do. We're going to have to decide how big is it. You know, like, is it a huge thing, a small thing? Is it going to have lots of counters in the box? Is it going to be 50 hours of voice acting? We're going to have to make sure it's measurable so we can break it down into smaller things. It's going to be something we actually can do. It's got to be actionable. If there are things about our project that we can't do ourselves, like if we want fancy artwork or fancy voice acting, we're going to be have to be able to find people who can do those. We want to make sure we treat everybody right. Uh, it's not that people like show up and mean to do bad things, but sometimes bad planning or something else can get in the way of that. We're going to uh, show you how to... Uh, just testing if we lost audio. To do bad things, but sometimes bad planning or something else can get in the way of that. We're going to lose audio? Uh, uh, someone complained, so did a quick chat. Go ahead and continue. Okay. Well, all, it's almost like the internet's full of 50,000 people who couldn't attend a convention today. So we apologize if we still have that. All right. Uh, speaking of response, like I said, a lot of people you'll start off with the best intentions, but there are things you might accidentally do. So we're going to talk about how to avoid that. And most importantly, we're going to talk about making sure things are timetabled. Uh, a lot of times people just want to like say, we'll be done when it's done. And like, you know, you could be talking about it's going to be done when it's done forever. When you start self-publishing, I mean, publishers publish. We're going to have to go ahead and get you from the idea stage to the actual physical stage where people can actually get stuff. Okay, so any project or any undertaking that you're going to do, I recommend that you break it down in these five things. You know, what are we doing? You know, when are we done? Can we do it? Should we do it? And when do we do it? Pretty simple. Uh, we're going to ignore this slide because this is from a different presentation. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about the first parts about what it is that we want to make. Okay. Now, uh, when you're going to make something, you have an idea about something. Uh, we're going to, uh, this is a big topic, but we're going to refer to intellectual property. When you decide you want to go ahead and make something, either it's your own idea, but maybe you want to go ahead and license something else. You may have noticed there's a lot of licensed products out there, like there's a World of Warcraft tabletop role-playing game. Or, Griffin, do, does Games Workshop ever do any licensing? Oh, it does a ton of licensing, especially now. Its current plan is really? actually to license out individual pieces of every property. For instance, uh, like the Warhammer brand uh, is currently with... Uh... The people who make Total War, and they have like Goodness. a huge chunk of it, but then there's other people who are making smaller products with smaller pieces of that identity. Yep. 
Uh, someone's asking in the chat, were either of you teachers? Uh, yes, I am an educator, both private and public sector. I'm not. I'm just dumb all the way through, so don't mind me. Oh, uh, no. Uh, at least you're easy on the eyes. Okay, so obviously many of you might have an idea that you want to go ahead and create yourself. But it's not impossible to go ahead and get an idea from somewhere else where you want to license something. There's something that kind of shocked me is there's an official My Little Pony role-playing game. Now, that doesn't shock me as much, except there's a company called Hasbro. Hasbro owns My Little Pony, and they also own Dungeons & Dragons. So you'd think that Hasbro would have gone ahead and made their own game, but no, it's a license. Somebody is licensing My Little Pony from a gaming company to make their own game. Likewise, if you want to go ahead and use Open Gaming License or some of the other programs, you might be beholden to some of those rules. The entire rules of the DM's Guild or Insider Campaign is a little beyond us, but the advantage you have there is you're doing a product that you're beholden to some rules, so you have to be responsible about it, but also people have already heard of it. Something that you may have heard of in gaming is often it's popular to do some bandwagoning, which is where you find some idea that's pretty popular that everybody likes, like everybody loves Cthulhu or everybody loves zombies, and go ahead and jump on that. Hey, if you've got a hot idea and it's got a narrow window of time when it's going to be popular, you should jump on it. That's when it's going to be very important that you have a good timetable because if there's a narrow window where this is going to be hip and cool. You need to get in and get out while it's still something that's going to be popular, especially if you're going to crowdfund it. And also extremely popular on Kickstarter are people finding older games and then revising them for a new audience. There was a really nice... Merchant of Venus that was updated recently. Uh, I've seen a couple of them go through, stuff like that. I'm sure you've got a couple favorites. So these are just ideas. When you get this, we're going to talk a little bit about contract later, but I'm sure you have some kind of idea. The idea is usually the easy part. But the next question is going to be something that's going to change our entire scope of our product. Who is your market and who are you selling to? I'm going to break the market into basically two different pieces here of premium and economy stuff. Premium stuff is that stuff that looks really super nice. That's your Gloomhaven, which comes in the big giant box and has a gazillion pieces. Um, these are the things that have like sculpted pieces or, or vacuum-formed plastic, hundreds of color cards, and cost like $100 or $200. They're expensive. They usually have small print runs, and they're often made for specific people. As much as you might like Gloomhaven, it's not Monopoly. You're probably not going to get casual players into it. It's a little complex. So it's very expensive, uh, but on the other hand, um, it looks really nice. The economy end is the other end where you're making something that's very, um, you know, a lower end and more modest. This is usually your 30 more options for the sorcerer class or your D&D module that you want to make really quickly. You, it usually has a lot of text, black and white, maybe a couple modest pictures, but also doesn't sell for a lot. So it's made with lower production value, but because it's going to be much less expensive and going to sell in the dollar to five dollar market, it's an economy product. These are the two zones you want to be in. One thing you want to worry about is when you're in the middle. If you get in the middle where your product is kind of expensive, but also kind of a lot of work, that's probably going to hurt you for your first product because you're going to have to put in a lot of effort and you're not going to see like a necessarily a huge return on it. An economy product might only sell to a few dozen people. Sorry, I apologize. A premium product might only sell to a dozen people or so, but because it's selling for $200 or $300 and it has a lot of return on it because it's for, you know big margins on it, you only need to sell a few. You can sell to a smaller market, but they're willing to pay more because you're giving them bigger production value. It's going to have a lot more responsibility to it, but you can do really nice stuff. That's why you may have seen the Kickstarter is full of all these really nice laser cut uh, presentations like that. Economy is where you see a lot of your D&D modules or character class options quick and easy. They're easy to make. You get in, get out. Uh, either way, those are the nice zones to be in. Be careful when you're making your product because if it's going to be a lot of effort, then you're probably going to want more money to make it easier and nicer. If you want to go ahead and make something that's going to be quick, uh, especially if it's your first product and you've never made something before, that's usually a good idea to go ahead and make that on the lower end of things. Okay, uh, any questions so far? So far the chat's been pretty lively. Uh, no more questions so far. I think you're free to keep okay. going. Well, obviously, you're going to have to go ahead and choose what materials you want. 
we're going to talk basically about three kinds of places where you can go ahead and make it a physical product or a digital product. I work mostly in role-playing games. A lot of my stuff is available digitally. Uh, we have worked on video games. Uh, usually we didn't make those physical. We made those through electronic distribution such as drive through RPG or Studio 2 and other pl and Amazon Prime that had digital downloads. Uh, if you want to go ahead and do a physical product, which is mass printing, you can do that. But when we talk about your actionable skill set, printing something physical requires a much more sophisticated skill set than making something digitally. You're going to have to do color separations and make sure it looks good. And if you mess something up digitally, you can patch it. So that's easy. Uh, it may be economy and have less production value, but you can patch it. So that's good for your first product. If you're going to do something that's physical, like a mass printing, you need to have some people on board who know how to do it or have the skills yourself. Okay, everybody pretty good so far? Looks good? Okay. So basically what you see here is I'm pretty sure you probably already have something in mind of what you want to make. Uh, I just wanted to get some terms out of the way. The next question is, how much of it are you going to sell? Like, I believe that whatever you make, even if it's the most fringe thing in the world, whatever you make uh, is going to sell to someone. It's really a question of how much. And this is when we get into measuring how much it's going to sell. Now, some of you may have worked before in retail. I'd ask for a show of hands, but we're on the internet. So you may have heard of something called the Pareto Principle. Griffin, have you heard of this? I very well may have heard of it before. Okay. You ran the presentation before. We did it last time. <laughs> okay. Talking about premium and economy stuff, often we like in business, we like talk about the Pareto principle, which is 80% of your business comes from about 20% of your customers. If some of you are video game people, you've probably heard the term whale. I don't necessarily want to talk about that. But people were really into stuff. If you're the kind of person who signed up for Gen Con online or would attend Gen Con so you can see the room-sized Settlers of Catan, you're a hardcore person who was willing to pay extra money for big wooden pieces and that kind of stuff. There are fewer people. More people will buy a casual, like Metallica plays Monopoly set. More people are casual gamers, but the hardcore people are willing to spend more. Uh, they're willing to have bigger game libraries and get an account on Board Game Geek and sell their used stuff and that kind of stuff. Uh, sometimes it's good that if you can manage it on a crowdfunding or something like that, you may have noticed a lot of crowdfundings usually have the low tier rewards and the big tier rewards. Like if you went to our recent Kickstarter for Iron Claw, you'd see that we had a low tier reward of pledge here and get a digital copy of our book. And then over here, we'd have pledge $200 and we'll draw a picture for you of your own character and put it in the book and give them a name and everything. That's an example of a premium reward. Not everybody is going to want to go ahead and spend a lot of money to get their own custom character put in the book, but a few people would. And it's an example of something we can offer for people who are want to go ahead and give us more money. On the other hand, if you look at the demographics of what we did, most people pledged for, I just want a digital copy of your book of corals. So, but when you look at the money, more money came from people who are willing to pledge for custom cameos, uh, extra copies of the book, other sorts of privileges there. So it's a good idea that when you're thinking of your crowdfunding, think about what can I offer people who really want stuff? And I'm guessing some of you are board game people. You've probably seen where they do the board game where they have this is the basic one, but pledge $200 will give you the laser cut wooden boards and the custom pieces, that sort of thing. Okay, everybody I think is pretty good so far. Okay, when it comes to measuring out your stuff, later we're going to talk about budgeting. And one thing that's important about budgeting is we're going to have to spend money to go ahead and create something. There are two major costs we're going to have to worry about when making something. The fixed cost, which is going to be how much it costs us, just a flat fee. That's going to include like your writing and your illustration, that sort of thing. That's stuff you pay for once and it's done. But then there's per unit costs. This is how much it costs to make individual things. If you're going to print books or make box games, you're going to have per unit. Each one you make is going to cost something. This is where a lot of Kickstarters get in trouble. So we'll talk about this. Obviously, with digital distribution, that's not that big of a deal. One thing that you're really shooting for when it comes to a crowdfunding like this is something called economy of scale. Your setup costs, illustration costs, and talent costs are fixed. So once you you know pay everyone to go ahead and set everything up, you know that's a single cost. Then you start paying per unit to be made. 
If you do larger print runs or larger assembly run, runs, instead of shipping each box copy individually and making one a day, if you can get a factory to make a thousand of these, load these in a shipping container and ship all of these at once to a distribution network, that's going to be, it's going to cost a lot of money, but it's going to be cheaper than trying to ship a thousand of these individually. So one thing you're shooting for with your Kickstarter is an economy of scale. This is why you would ask for a big number. Sure, if you gave me $100, I could go ahead and get the safety scissors out and make cut and piece to make a cute little board game for one person, like I'm an Etsy person. But my goal would be if I could make a really nice one for a 1,000 people. And for that, I would need $100,000. That's why we put a big goal on the Kickstarter so we can get all that money to get there, because I don't have $100,000. Do you have $100,000? Okay. So that's one of our goals when it comes to budgeting. That's what ki what crowdfunding is supposed to be for. Okay. So far, everybody's pretty quiet. I haven't seen any text. So okay. I think they're all so paying rapt person. attention. Excellent. All right. So part of our goal, the reason why we have to decide how many of these we're going to make is because that's going to tell us what our final budget is. We're going to have to pick a number like 10,000 or 20,000 units to make. So we know what we have a goal and we've got to be, you know, we have to decide what that is before we start. That's why I said it's got to be measurable before we start. We got to decide what we're going to make and then how many of it we're going to make. And that's got to be like, and then we have to ask for that money. In fact, we have to ask for slightly more money. All right. Yeah. It's good to see people active in the chat. Okay. I have a question then, if you want to see it. Uh, are distribution oh, costs taken from the purchase price uh, considered costs that you have to take into account? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Distribution costs are going to be a per unit cost. When I get to the budgeting part at the end here, we're going to show you, like, because you have to distribute something, the more the more units you sell, the more your distribution costs go up. So that's per unit. And that is a danger zone that we're going to talk about responsibility. I've seen way too many Kickstarters where they budgeted to make the units, but they didn't budget to ship the units. And they also didn't budget for the fact that Kickstarter takes 10%, Backer kit takes 15%. Uh, there might be other royalty payments or other things that take percentages off of that. They didn't budget for that safety zone. And so they, even though they paid the money and made all the units, sh distributing the units out of the warehouse was going to cost them even more money. And if some of you are hardcore Kickstarter people, you may have heard a sob story. We're going to talk a little bit about sob stories like that. It's like, don't let that happen to you. We need to make sure that we budget that after we make the stuff, we have to ship the stuff. Yeah, Nicholas is saying in the chat all those horror stories. In fact, there it is right there in the chat. Don't forget shipping. Okay. So also, one thing I warn people about is to put a cap on your rewards. Even if it's something ridiculous like 10, like you're only going to sell 10,000 copies. Like you may have seen that when we sell books, our printed copies will always have a max of like 10,000 or 20,000. We almost never hit that in the original crowdfunding, but we just put that. Let's see, is there supposed to be a fixed cost? Uh, yeah, somebody's asking, is that going to be fixed cost per unit, number of units equals budget? It's going to be a little more complicated than that, die alone. Uh, so we'll get to that in the budgeting a little bit later. Uh, but I just want to warn folks, putting a maximum in your rewards, uh, this is the big warning sign. Some of you are probably old school nerds. Any uh, orders of the stick fans here? Rich Berlue? Rich Berlue is a nice guy. But a couple of years ago, he did a Kickstarter and he said, hey, if you pledge at this reward, I'll give you a custom stick figure and autograph in your book. And then he didn't put a cap on it. <laughs> last I heard last year, he was still doing these sketches because he got like thousands of them. I so, recall the wrist injury. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, yeah, you read about his wrist injury. So just put a cap on it. Hey, you probably won't hit it, but Kickstarter, Indigo, and the rest of those guys let you put a cap on something. That's why I say stay in control. Uh, don't... You know, also, like, maybe you were thinking about putting these in your own garage and then shipping them out. I don't recommend that. But if you were going to go, if you had a space for it, then, you know, heaven forbid that you wind up like on the Ellen show or whatever and go viral with your one little product and suddenly get spam for all of it. If you didn't have the space to hold all of this, you might run into trouble. Just put a cap on it. You guys are gamers. You know that stuff that doesn't have a soft cap or a max on it is bad news. If you're doing an economy, oh, what well, question here from Peng Winter? If you're doing an economy product like a small scenario, uh, is Kickstarter still worth market for the product? You know, that's a good question. Um, 
Kickstarter every now and then does special promotions. Uh, I think Indiegogo does too, but Kickstarter will do like a theme, like certain types of creators. A while ago, Kickstarter did something cute called Quickstarter, which was your product has to be, uh, you have to have one product and you're only delivering a hundred of them. Uh, honestly, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about other values of Kickstarter as a marketing tool. So I'll go ahead and address that a little bit, Peng. Uh, the, I'm gonna, uh, but the other answer is, the other problem with doing a Kickstarter is there's going to be fees. Kickstarter takes 11%. Backer kit will take like 15, 25, 35%. So if you did a Kickstarter like that, you might, up, you might wind up losing a tenth to a third of your money before you even get started. So... If it's, a, if it's a pamphlet that you could just do because you can draw and you can write and you can make a PDF, you're going to have to ask yourself, is it really worth that 10 or 20% hit when I could just immediately start selling it? And Achibushi is talking about Make 100. I think I've heard about that. I'm familiar with Project 500, which is GMT, where gamers represent, uh, where, where um, they would do quick stuff. So also, Peng, we'll talk a little bit about um, um, using Kickstarter as a marketing tool. Oh, and I just want to have a quick note here. When you do your Kickstarter, all these kinds of fancy things like bonus rewards, those are optional, okay? Don't feel like you have to do like custom card mats or jackets or engraved dice. If this is your first crowdfunding, you really want to make a product and sell it to people. And these kinds of like extra tchotchkes or whatever can easily get out of control. I'm sure some of you have a horror story where they're saying like, I still haven't gotten my metal dice. If, if it's something... Look, you're here because you want to make a game or a book. You're not a die engraver. So if it's outside of your wheelhouse and you don't quite understand it, I would recommend don't feel like you have to do it. Yeah, Hachibushi calls that stretch goal bloat. So yeah, you folks know what I'm talking about. So speaking of that kind of bloat, so we've talked about specifically what we would make and how much of it we would make. Now we're going to go and seg here into is it something we can actually do? When it comes to doing things, there are two types of hands that are going to be involved with this. Your hands and other people's hands. There's going to be stuff that you can do yourself and stuff that other people can do. When I started the Sanguine Games, I had experience as an illustrator, uh, a typesetter, a graphic designer, uh, a writer. Uh, I, I had all those tools myself, so I could go ahead and make the thing myself if I had to. And if you're talking about doing a small pamphlet, like uh, Peng was talking about earlier, that's probably something you know you can do yourself. You can type, you can probably export a PDF, sign up for something, off you go. Easily stuff in-house. When you're starting to talk about getting a little fancier here, you might have to want to go ahead and hire other people. Even though you could do some writing or do some art, maybe there's other people who could do it better for you. Uh, and that's when you want to hire freelancers. That's one good place where you might want to go ahead and do a Kickstarter because you can talk to other freelancers and ask them, how much will you charge? Because you will have to pay other people. You will have to pay other freelancers. In fact, you if you want to do a really fancy Kickstarter, you're probably going to need artwork and the presentation in the first place. You're going to have to pay people. Don't do this kind of thing where you're talking about paying them an exposure uh, we can talk about revenue share, like paying them royalties later, but let's be honest here. This is probably your first project. You have no history. I've got history, so I feel better about telling folks I can do revenue share. But if you're new to the business, you know, who necessarily trusts you on that kind of stuff? You might have to get a war chest ready before you even get started and spend a few bucks to show that you're serious about this. But also one of the nice parts about uh, freelancing uh, one really nice part about crowdfunding, I'm sorry, uh, is that bef back in the old days before we had a good crowdfunding, when we first did our games like Iron Claw and a couple of other things, we had to guess. We had to say, I, I guess maybe we'll sell 10,000 of these. So we had to go scrape and get some money, you know, work some jobs and get some money together uh, and uh, um, get all this together. And uh, I'll answer your question here in a second, Peng. But now that we have crowdfunding, we can know in advance uh, an idea of how many of this would actually sell. Like when Peng was talking about making a pamphlet, it's like, well, maybe Peng wants to go ahead and hire uh, a lot more uh, fancy illustrators, but that might cost me $1,000. Is it worth it for my pamphlet? Would I get a return of $1,000? Well, you could crowdfund it. If you get the $1,000 in the crowdfunding, that showed that people were serious enough that you can go ahead and buy the expensive art. If you didn't get into the crowdfunding, hooray, you didn't spend $1,000 on something that wasn't going to have that kind of return. So you can look at crowdfunding here as an example of advanced marketing.
Um, and yeah, when you're talking about finding freelancers, uh, let me drill, go ahead and mention ArtStation real quick. Okay, um, Griffin, are we still good on the PowerPoint? Yes, we sure are. Okay, sorry. Sometimes we've had a flicker there. Um, uh, I know a couple of good places to look for art stations. The big one that I know, uh, honestly, I do a lot of looking around. I would avoid Peng Peng Water Winter. Sorry, Peng Winter. I would avoid places like um, Fiverr and that kind of stuff because it's not that I have anything against those kinds of freelancers. It's that since you really don't know who these guys are, uh, they'll often and they're doing it on the cheap. They'll often be reappropriating other materials from other sites, which gets into intellectual property and copyright laws. I've seen some horror stories here where people commission folks. When we talk about contracts here near the end, we'll talk about insuring yourself against that. But you could wind up with people who just like grab some Google images and give it to you uh, or copy and paste from web pages or something like that. It might not be that great. So um, ArtStation has been pretty good. There's also several other resources. Uh, I know RPG Net has freelancers. Uh, Reddit has a freelancer forum. Um, looking around, and yeah, I'm not a big fan of Five versus Mystery Cycle. There. Uh, also, check the credits of some of the other games that you really like. You may have noticed that, like, like what always fascinates me is how much of games like Dungeons and Dragons are written by freelancers, like Monty Cook, Jonathan Tweet. Those guys were not never full time. Uh, employees while they were working on those books so look in the credits and uh if those folks have a, a business page call those folks up all right but yeah to get back to it uh yes in fact like i just mentioned here in the kickstarter you're gonna need to ask for all the money you need up front now one thing you might want to decide about is how long do you want to pitch this thing if you're just making a small sort of D&D module that's going to be like, you know, very quick and like a one shot or an expansion to Dungeon World or something like that, uh, you might want to go ahead and make that, post it digitally and be done with it. But if you've got a bigger passion project, like a video game that you want to make a lot of DLC for or a box game that you're going to warehouse somewhere and then sell it, you have to be concerned about the product's lifetime. How long are you willing to commit to selling this? If you're going to make a lot of box games and warehouse them somewhere, you're looking at a two to three to five year commitment of hawking this at conventions and reopen again, heaven willing, uh, or other things that you're going to have to push it around. If you don't want to do that kind of commitment, you might want to think twice about making 10,000 of something if you want to push it around. Uh, this is also why some crowdfundings ask for a little less money than they need. Like some of the stuff that we've done uh, here uh, at Sanguine, we like asked, we only got like 8,000 or 10,000 for something that was supposed to be a 15 to $20,000 product, but we're already going to conventions. We're already selling a big line. I was willing to commit to pushing this for another five years. So I was willing to ask for slightly less because way back when we talked about that 20% rule with Pareto, I was thinking that some people were willing to commit up front. I was willing to believe that um, people who are willing to prepay for a product that doesn't exist, those are the hardcore 20% people. I, you can pretty much bet that for every one person who crowdfunds, there will be four people later who will buy it once it exists because they're not crowdfunders. They don't like to fund stuff that doesn't exist or they heard about it from someone else or they can actually see it and that kind of thing. This isn't like exact, you'll see mismatches here, but because I'm willing to commit to two or three years of development, because I believe that for every dollar we got from Kickstarter, we could get $4 later, uh, then you know I'm willing to commit to lifetime. That's a little dangerous way to think because that's gonna be a lot of hard work. So ask yourself, are you willing to devote the next three years of your life to this? Some of you are passionate and will say yes. And some of you are going, eh, you might want to scale down your first little project because I'd rather see you, I'd rather see you have a modest success than a big failure. Okay. Um, yeah, chat's pretty good so far. We're doing all right, Griffin? Yep. Everything's looking all good. Right. Okay. Um, oh, right. I just mentioned that 8%. I go faster than my PowerPoint. All right. Well, so far, we have a lot of questions. We're making some pretty good time. So we just went through the first half of our presentation in a half hour. Um, but uh, yeah, and the question's been pretty good so far. So once again, folks, please stop me because I'll talk a mile a minute. Okay. 
I just want to make some quick notes here about responsibility. I don't think anyone starts off wanting to do bad things, but a phrase I heard recently is constructed fraud. That's where we didn't start out to rip people off, but at some point we just kind of decided we weren't going to do it because it was too much hard work or, you know, it's too much stress for me to deliver stuff. Okay, we're not going to do that. Um, here we go. This is a big thing uh, you may have seen. Let me highlight a phrase out of this from uh, 2015. Hey, Griffin, I think we have a link to this article. Uh, yes, we do. I will paste it in chat. Okay. Uh, this is an interview with Peter Molyneux, who famously had a um, uh, uh, a um, big Kickstarter. Uh, and uh, let's see, he did a big Kickstarter for something called Got Us, which he never delivered on. And here's a phrase out of it. If you ask for too much money up front because of the rules of Kickstarter, it's very, very hard to ask for the complete development budget. Okay. The technical name for that is a lie. That is not true in any step of the word. Earlier when I was talking about uh, how we were um, you know, going to be responsible about this and maybe we might budget a little lower, okay, Peter Molyneux should know better than this. And notice he hasn't done a crowdfunding since then because that is fraud. If he didn't think he could deliver on the product with the money he had, he should have asked for more money. Also, he got more money than he asked for. So if the Kickstarter went over budget, why did it not succeed? Don't let that happen to you. That is definitely not true. Another thing I want to warn folks about is flexible funding. Okay, some sites like Indiegogo allow for flexible funding. What flexible funding is, is where you ask for a goal, but even if you don't meet it, you um, uh, you still get the money. Like, for example, if you said it's going to cost me 10 grand to make my product, uh, but you do it on Indiegogo as flexible funding, and you only get five grand, horrible things happen. First of all, Indiegogo charges all the customers, then they take a big piece of the five grand, bigger than they would have taken if you used regular funding, like a 20 to 25% cut. Then they hand you the uh, 3,500 that's left over and tell you, okay, make your product, which makes no sense because if you needed $10,000, you should have asked for $10,000. What are you gonna do with like one third the money that you were gonna do it on in the first place? Just kind of pal around or kind of you know piece about? Right, some people in the chat are saying, don't back flexible funding, don't do it. It's not ethical. I'm especially not happy with the way the wording is on here because if you read um, uh, their website, uh, they've got it worded in such a way it says, oh, no, we're not responsible here at Indiegogo. If you could still make it with less money than you needed, choose flexible funding. Well, if you could have done it with less money than you needed, ask for what you need and have stretch goals later. Don't lowball your budget. Don't be these guys. Don't be Molly New because that's actually fraud and you could get prosecuted for it. People have been cracking down on it. Also, I want to put myself up here for the embarrassment of this. Don't be embarrassed if you don't meet your Kickstarter goal. Like I said earlier, hooray, we didn't go ahead and make a huge product that cost us a lot of money that wasn't going to make its returns. We were able to use Kickstarters to rough and feel this out. Obviously, Brissy Grimmer has a question here. Have you dealt with the make-on-demand places of Amazon's? Yes, in fact, uh, earlier I, I brushed over print-on-demand uh, yes, print on demand is an excellent way to go ahead and make your stuff. Like Amazon will press uh, DVDs for you. They used to call it Create Space, and they call it something else now at Amazon. However, watch their production costs on this. Print on demand products often will cost a lot more individually. Like a, a full color book will cost forty or fifty dollars to you, the maker just your production costs to make it. And then you can only sell it for $60. So you're only getting like a $10 margin on it. So you're spending 50 to make a $60 book. On the other hand, you since it's print on demand, uh, people just order it. So you don't have a huge inventory you have to worry about. So like a lot of the stuff on drive through RPG, I don't have a huge warehouse full of books. If you order a copy of Bleeding Edge, they make it for $40 uh, and then, you know, Send uh, charge fifty dollars, so I get like a ten dollar. Well, after distribution costs a six dollar cut, and they ship it to you. But I don't have a huge inventory, so I'm not making a huge amount of money on sales. But I also don't have a lot of risk, and that's good if you're a small time person. When you're going into Kickstarter to get these huge Gloomhaven type box games, now you're taking a much bigger risk, which is why you need a lot more money. In fact, that's part of where the economy of scale comes from. 
some of that stuff that you see on these expensive games with custom plastic molded pieces or metal engraved stuff that if that was done print on demand it would cost hundreds of dollars they're getting a fixed cost to get machines set up to run off runs of a thousand at a time and then they're getting a discount to sell it to you that's part of why you're crowdfunding so when you're setting up your crowdfunding, ask yourself if you're going to do it as print on demand or if you do a mass run. If you're going to do it as print on demand, then you only need to cover your fixed costs because that other stuff happens on demand. If you want to do a much larger run, you're going to have to ask for more money to get the economy of scale. Either way, it varies on your product, and we'll talk about both of those in the budgeting. Okay, Contra19 has a question here. When you're hiring freelancers, how do you know if you're being fair with how much you pay them? Uh, when you're being overcharged by someone who has no experience in the field. Um, we're going to talk a little bit here about contracts, but today it's pretty easy to know where a freelancer comes from. Uh, like I said earlier, when you're looking for freelancers, I recommend looking in the credits of books you already like to see if they're already listed in there. Uh, because obviously if they produced work that you liked before, they have a track record to go ahead and produce it in the future. Another thing about overcharging, one thing that's really nice about crowdfunding is you don't have to worry about overcharging. You can set up a contract in advance to ask the freelancer, how much money do you want for this? I need 50,000 words. How much would you charge me for this? I need 100 illustrations. And remember I said earlier, being specific and measurable, I need 100 illustrations of color, this big, this size. How much would you charge me for it? You can then take whatever number they give you and put that in your budget and then ask for a Kickstarter. Hooray, no one's being overcharged. If the um, artwork is as good as you think it is, the uh, freelancer is charging you an honest rate uh, because that's what they think their work, their work is uh, worth. And if you meet the crowdfunding, huzzah, everyone's happy. Uh, so it could be workable. Yes, um, Rissy, in fact, a lot of stuff I do is print on demand. And when we talk about budgeting later, I wanna show that. Uh, but once again, it's a question of what you want. Some of the really nice stuff like custom engraved dice or plastic molded pieces, um, you know, you may have noticed that right now custom miniatures are still in the 40 to $50 range each, like individual figures. So if you want to do a large run, I know the Reaper Miniatures company does Kickstarters for much bigger runs than that. So if your stuff is possible to do print on demand, yes, I would recommend that for your first publishing product, you could do it print on demand. In fact, if you can do it print on demand and you already have the resources, you already have the skills, you might not even need a crowdfunding. You might not want to spend the 11 to 15 to 25% of your money on crowdfunding. You might just want to go straight to press and not worry about it. Uh, let's see, I should be using contract to commitment. Yes. To quote The Simpsons, a contract is an agreement that is unbreakable. So, uh, yeah, um, uh, little Leonatos is asking if you can get bids. You, uh, what you would do in the bidding process is you'd probably ask several artists by using their contact information, how much would they charge? And then based on how much they would charge, you would then get a contract before you get started. And we'll talk about contracts here in a little bit. But yeah, you'll get a contract that says, we agree to pay you this on this. I recommend getting the contract signed, but you have to get the contract uh, you know, signed or whatever. You tell the artist, be honest with them. I'm getting this contract in advance to go ahead and get a crowdfunding later. Like when we did Madcap, uh, we worked with uh, Andrew Dickman, who was one of the animators for Looney Tunes. You guys seen the Looney Tunes project? Andrew Dickman had a hole in his schedule. He was willing to work with us. We paid him some money up front. And then we said, we want the option to go ahead and hire you for more art later. And he, he it was a professional, totally amenable to that. So we got a really nice product out of that. So yeah, I just want to put out there, it's you're better off having a crowdfunding that doesn't meet its goal than you are to try and low bid and then try to make it work with terrible funds. Also, you can always go back and crowdfund later. People worry about, well, what about the stigma of having a failed crowdfunding? Okay, there isn't one. I have never seen anyone say their last crowdfunding failed, so I'm not going to go ahead and fund their other one. I have seen people say they didn't deliver on their last crowdfunding, so why should we give them money? I've seen that. But I don't want to talk a lot of smack about people here. I just want to say your crowdfunding is also your market research. Would people have paid you for this? In the bad old days, you would have had to make the thing, sell the thing, and then when it didn't meet its demands, you probably would have had your soul crushed. Yeah, Ashi, Ashi is right. People, uh, people, the hardcore 20% Pareto want to see you succeed. And 
I've had a couple of crowdfundings fail, but that's, like I said, that was better than making the thing and finding out it was just going to fail in the marketplace. So once again, to put this thing back up here, the budget for your, uh, uh, for your crowdfunding, as well as the crowdfunding cost needs to be equal to or less than your goal. I say less because other, like you have to budget for horrible things that will go bad. Maybe you won't be able to get your PowerPoint presentation set up online in time. I mean, that would be horrible if that happened, right Griffin? Yeah, that'd be terrible. Uh, let's never speak of it again. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like, things can go bad. Maybe your garage gets flooded. Maybe the United States Postal Service suddenly gets underfunded and all of their shipping goes triple. Other things could happen, so you want to go ahead and budget a little extra. Once again, it's better to ask for more money than you need in case something goes wrong, because the opposite, where you don't have enough money and you still have to deliver on something, that's soul-crushing. Stay away from that. Um, when we're also a bit responsible, it's another thing about whether you're a big seller. Uh, these are two things that I like. We got links to these, Griffin, if you can drop this. Okay, these are things that fascinate me. Like, for example, uh, a couple of years ago uh, for Tomb Raider, uh, Tomb Raider sold 3.4 million copies but failed to hit expectations. Okay, I just want to let that sink in a little bit. This was the new Tomb Raider reboot. Okay, this sold more copies than any other Tomb Raider ever did ever. It was, in fact, the best-selling game that's, uh, that uh, Enix ever had. Like, it was their, their best-selling game of all time. Oh, that didn't mean expectations. And, like, what the heck does that mean? What were you guys thinking? Oh, they are thinking they are going to sell 5 million copies. For us old people, you may have heard the E.T. stories. The E.T. Uh, Atari game cartridge, you've seen, like, gamers make fun of it, is still one of the top 20 selling video games of all time. Okay, it, it sold better, you know, than Battleborn, which was in Ready Player One. It's huge. It, it sold millions of copies. But the guys who made it made more copies of E.T. than, than consoles that existed. They set their goals way too high. Now, you're an indie person. No one's heard of you. Okay, this is your first product, so you're kind of untried. Maybe you've got a name or two. Also, a lot of times I hear people trying to do this big splash thing, like the big video game guys say, we have to sell our copies in the first six weeks, people will forget we exist. Okay, that's not true for you. You're an indie person that no one's heard of, and you're going to be stumping this thing probably for the next two, three, or five years, building up word of mouth. Uh, one of the big examples I like to use is um, uh, Undertale. Has anyone heard of Undertale? Have you heard of that, Griffin? Oh, yes. Uh, it was yeah. uh, a few years ago, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's 2015. It's still a thing. Undertale comes out for the Switch. Everyone's all excited, like five, six years later. Okay, it, you don't have to make all your sales in the first few weeks or whatever. You're in this, you know, this is going to be a commitment. So I believe in you, and I believe you can do it. Yeah, build yourself, uh, take your books to bury in the desert, or build yourself a fortress. Okay, here's something that's a bit more practical. Uh, here's a sob story, and we have a link for this one, Griffin. That's already okay. in the chat. Excellent. So here's a sob story that we've heard of, uh, When the Water Tastes Like Wine. This is a small indie project, and from my own digging here, I was able to find the following bits of information about it. In this own article, they say they about they had about a $140,000 budget to make this video game. Uh, it's got Sting as voice acting. I'm always surprised by that, Griffin. I mentioned that before, right, that we had... Oh, yeah, last time you went all over it, and uh, it's definitely yeah. an interesting choice. Yeah, no no one knows who the voice actors are in this. They... they, they, they Burn their hearts out on this. But notice here that we've got here in the numbers here, it's a $140,000 budget. As near as I can tell, they would have eaten up about 25% of that in distribution with Steam and Amazon and that sort of thing. Uh, and in, uh, as near as I can tell from my own research, they moved about 4,000 units in their first six weeks. And they were adamant. They said, "This we're a company no one's ever heard of. Some of us worked on Firewatch. We have to move all of our units in the first six weeks or we'll disappear out of sight. Uh, so they needed to move 4,000 units at $20 retail. So they only made about, uh, you know, so the money that came in was way less than their budget. So they lost about $80,000 and they said, and they were, they're all sad. They said they were crushed. I feel bad for them, but I don't think any of this was realistic. It's like, it, this is the kind of word of mouth game that needed to build. And they probably spent way too much on the production than they should have. You should be more like a small indie person. Uh, this game is a very similar game. It's another, like, talky, visual novel-themed game. Uh, I'm estimating, uh, once again, based on the evidence I could find, they sold about 2,300 units, give or take, 
maybe more, maybe less distribution costs. And their budget, according to Kickstarter, was only 15 grand. So they got 15 up, uh, up front and they went and paid for all that. So notice that by these numbers, even though these guys sold fewer units, they sold like about half as many copies as when the water tastes like wine, these folks aren't going and making a big sob story about it. They sold less copies, but they made more money. And that's because they controlled their costs. They didn't have any voice acting. They did some of the illustrations themselves and hired some freelancers. They pared the game down to where it's not as complex. It's more of a visual novel. So it was more actionable with their own skill set. And they were profitable. So the folks who made this are not sad. So I don't want you to be sad. Right, and as Mystery is saying, this was our, our market. I think there was a market for when the water tastes like wine. There are people who love that kind of like talky visual novel. Uh, you know, Firewatch, which was a previous game of the same devs, demonstrated that people enjoy exploration and experiential games. Um, but yeah, these guys, um, but no, once again, notice their numbers are way more modest, but their budget was more modest. You want to stay modest and in control. Um, yeah, one of the things I used to tell is a story about the first game my company made was, uh, or the first company I worked on uh, before I incorporated, was Dutchman, Switzer, Spaniard, Swede. It was a game about fighting the Dutch and the Swiss in the Thirty Years' War. And all five people who bought this game thought it was great. But that's okay. We only we knew like only a very few people were going to buy it, so we controlled the cost, made a tiny thing, and got it out the door. That's what we call catering to an underserved market. If What's you're the making a price for three people, like a thousand each, <laughs> uh, you know, I forget, but um, I know more details about GMT games. I love GMT games, they make uh, a lot of uh, war games. They have Project 500, which is where they wait, it's like crowdfunding, they wait until they get 500 pre orders and then they make the game and they make it uh, like the most obscure wars you've ever heard of, like you know, specific conflicts in Sengoku or some one very specific campaign that happened in East Africa hyper specific games but they're making them for the 500 people who want them and and uh um, project 500 has been going on longer than kickstarter so god bless gmt games they make stuff for people who want stuff yeah and also mystery watch out for that typo because you used to make the typo it's underserved and not undeserved um honestly as, as an angry indie person like if you're an independent person uh i mentioned bandwagoning earlier if you make a cthulhu zombie pirate game you're probably going to get lost in the shuffle of everything else that's currently in that market. You might still like float your boats higher because some people can't get enough of that, but you're not going to make a big splash. But if you can find something, when we made Iron Claw back in 1999, like furry, there were no furry games on the market. There was like furry pirates, which had a short distribution and came out like six weeks before us. But other than that, if you wanted to play like kind of anthropomorphic fantasy, there wasn't anything. Maybe there was some add on stuff it's not like today where you know tabaxi and akakura are default options in dungeons and dragons but back then no one was doing that and then we went when and made specific games for specific stuff we made madcap which is a screwball comedy game people kept asking us aren't there other screwball comedy games no there aren't the tune was 25 years old at that point so find something that people aren't making and make your passion project about that uh you know make something that speaks to you but also speaks to other people who aren't getting stuff they want Oh, wow, Hachibushu is uh, um, old school here, GMT. Yes, God bless GMT. Those guys are great. Okay, so once again, also, when we talk about responsibility, about setting your price, I talked about, like, not getting your soul crushed. When I ask how much you're going to charge for this, charge more. Don't lowball your price and think, well, I could charge $40, but I'm worried I'll get less people, so I'll charge $30. do not do that. Because then your margin is going to go down, and then when you have other costs, like the warehousing costs, the insurance costs, or the taxes, uh, you're going to wind up feeling pretty sad about that. Uh, because it's like, why did I work so hard and then didn't make any money? So don't let that happen to you. Uh, it's better to round up on these costs and charge a little bit more in case something goes wrong. Lowering your price from $40 to $30 isn't going to get you 25% more sales it would to make up for that shortfall. Uh, yeah, I think Tales of the Filling Vagabond was recently redone. I don't know if it was crowdfunded. Okay, the next question is, how many are you going to sell? Way back then, we talked about measurable. One nice thing about a Kickstarter or a crowdfunding is you'll know how many people backed it, so you'll know how many people you could sell in the initial run. But when you're doing your original budgeting, if you think you might be able to sell 2,000 or 3,000, you'll probably wind up selling less than that. 
That's the warning to take away from when the water tastes like wine. They said they had to sell a certain amount within six weeks. That amount was, you know, the amount they got was probably 4,000. I don't know what number they thought they were going to get, but don't be like Square Enix thinking we're going to sell 5 million of this. You're not. No one's heard of you. Uh, take whatever number you think might sell and make it a little lower than that. That way, if you sell more than that, hooray, you sold more than that. You can always do another print run. Uh, yeah, uh, Brizzy, you've got to totally work. Make something that speaks to you that no one else is doing. Uh, you can go ahead and do in, in licensing and that sort of thing, but remember, that's going to be a whole different issue. Wait, what? There we go. Okay. So we set our sales goal, how much we're going to charge per product, uh, how many we're going to sell. We multiply those two together, you know, you know, consumer price times units. That gives us a budget. And then that bud, uh, and then that starting number, we have to raise that for other costs such as distribution and mailing, and of course some room for profit. Okay, uh, I promise I was going to talk about this, Griffin. We got another link here: uh, contracts with your uh, clients. We're running a little ahead of schedule here, so I can talk a little bit more about contracts. This contract link that we're dropping here is a sample contract that we've been using while we assembled it with the help of professionals it has not been reviewed by a lawyer and thus there might be terms in it that uh are quasi legal i will say i use this sometimes i run into people in these streams who say they'd never use a contract if it hasn't been reviewed by a lawyer hey more power to you you must have deep pockets and can afford hundreds of dollars for retainers if you can go for it uh but this is a sample contract and it has a gazillion annotations in it but you'll see that it addresses many of the specific issues. There's a section here where you tell your talent exactly what it is they're supposed to do, specific and measurable. Uh, and you've probably already decided by talking to your talent what they can actually do, what's actionable. Uh, and then it especially has uh, an indemnity clause in it. Someone was asking earlier, how do I know if my freelancers are up to the work? There's an indemnity clause in this contract that says you're accepting it in good faith, that if the client like did something unethical, that's their fault in case they get involved in any struggles, you know, heaven forbid. Uh, and also, um, it's got specific deadlines in it. Remember that when you're in a production pipeline and you're making something, you need stuff from the talent before it goes out to people. It's not the stuff shows up and then the box is made and it goes off to people. You need to get it in advance. You need to proof it. You need to check it, uh, you know, get it set up and then sent out. Now, many of you folks are gamers. So if you're a gamer, You've seen a rule book before. The contract is your rule book. Can you save movement points from turn to turn? No, you can't, because the rule book says you can't. The contract is supposed to be, can be as specific or as vague as you want. I recommend being specific. If you're dealing with a freelancer who uh, ha they might have a specific contract they want, go ahead and do it. Uh, you know, like like ask them what contract they want and review it and do it by their terms. Sure, but always have a contract. If you're just getting stuff from people without a contract you're at risk. You don't have any indemnity insurance, so you don't know, uh, you know if they did it wrong. And also, notice this contract has work for hire terms. If you're buying artwork from someone, you have to specifically say, I'm getting the copyright to this artwork. If you don't like buy that outright, you're only leasing that. You're only getting a service and you don't have the copyright on that. They still do. So, that's why you either have to specify um, that you're getting it outright as work for hire, or in the case of when you're leasing something, like we did Usagi Ojimbo or Nogglestones as a licensing, we specified a specific time frame. Any good licensor will say you can only be in a specific time frame for this. Okay, so is Veers feeling better? I'm glad you're feeling better, Veers. Yeah, uh, and also, once again, feel free to customize this contract. This is based on what we've been doing over the years and talking to folks when uh, licensors wanted specific clauses in that. There's also lots of annotations, so feel free to make changes to it. Uh, and if you have any suggestions, let us know. Uh, we're all ears. So I thought maybe you would appreciate that. Okay, I think we're good on questions so far. Griffin, you all right? Yep, I'm doing good. Right. And we're questions, uh, we're good too. All right. So the last thing, of course, is deadlines. Yes, uh, timetabled. 
if you're doing a crowdfunding, like if it's just a project you're doing on your own, you've probably known people like this. It's like, yeah, I'm making my own fantasy world. I've decided they have a calendar. It's about 216. I haven't decided the sidereal day is going to be 20 hours, 24 hours. So I've been working on it. It's kind of going to be done when I'm done. That means it's never going to be done. Okay. Like uh, until we actually commit to some sort of deadline and make it, uh, you know, you could be futzing with this stuff forever. It's never quite done. You're always going to have something else that you can go ahead and edit later. The purpose behind a deadline is to have some kind of structure. Uh, that's why I'm a big fan of uh, NaNoWriMo. Any NaNoWriMo people here? I mean, yeah, that's where you just go ahead and like write a 50,000 word novel in, a, in the month of November. Whether you do it or not, the purpose behind that is it's a smart goal. It's specific, measurable, actionable, and timetable. It's, you know, 50,000 words in a month. Either do it or don't, but it's an exercise to show you how to work in a structured deadline market. Yeah, so Denorimo people here, good. I um, tried it once or twice, too. Uh, I don't think I do more than 4,000 words a week, so uh, <laughs> not yeah. me that cool. I've never finished Nanorimo, but, you know, we do the other books, so I don't feel as bad. Oh, my favorite things. Yes, and of course, let's have the uh, Hall of Shame here. Uh, these are all products that miss their deadline. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's actually come to really bite them in the butt. Uh, in fact, them fighting herds recently made news because it was like they were making esports out of it because its net code is better than other esports games. So here in the make headlines in 2020, I thought was kind of funny. Yeah, so um, I rate plays. Yeah, you're never... Well, also, that depends a lot on the director. Uh, that's good news, Runner Krosky. Uh, um, yeah, Agile Method, which I, I should probably do a slide on that. I've never actually done the Agile Method. Uh, well, it's kind of more of a programming thing, and so I'm responding to them because that's my background here. The Agile Method is just like you set small goals, you do the next small goal, and you just keep doing the small goals until the thing is complete. It's right. pretty good, break and it, there's a bunch of break... different branches off of that that have a couple different twists to it. Right, break it down to smaller milestones and then pass the milestones. Uh, yeah, so people say, I didn't know Exaltos. Yeah, see? So evidently it didn't haunt them if uh, Mystery Cycle didn't know about it. They got the money in October 2013 and didn't have their first deliverable until 2016. So, um, uh, it, it's not, you don't want to miss the deadlines, but you need to at least have a deadline, because if you just say it's going to be done when I'm done, people aren't going to crowdfund a project that's, that doesn't have a deadline. And also, the crowdfunding people demand a deadline, so you're going to have to give them one anyway. Okay, uh, one thing I mentioned earlier about the timetable is you're going to have to ask yourself if you want to go ahead and do this for the long tail. Uh, like I mentioned, um, if you're just doing print on demand, like someone asked me about earlier, you can get that set up, get that book on Amazon Prime, or get that box on Game Crafter, uh, and then put it up there, and then you're done. It can just either people buy it, or they don't. It's print on demand, so you don't have any inventory you have to worry about. You don't have to go um, uh, stumping it around at conventions and that sort of thing. Perfect. However, uh, if you're going to do a much bigger project like a box game, like your big giant gloom havens, uh, you're probably going to have a lot of those in a warehouse and be stumping those for a while. This is what I taught. Th this is what Molly New was badly talking about. That's when I said, like, okay, I'm planning on selling 20% of my entire inventory in the initial uh, crowdfunding phase, and then 80% of my inventory over the next two to three years. Um, that's what I plan for as a businessman. I'm willing to make that commitment and I have a schedule and a pipeline. I'm going to conventions, but I'm a full-time designer. If you're doing this in your part-time, we just want to be casual about it. Do you really want to commit to a schedule like this? You might uh, have to like tone it down, make it more responsible and that sort of thing. Uh, you need someone skilled in project management. Yeah. J versus that's, um, uh, that is a big problem when you're the, when you self-publish, you're the boss. One reason why a lot of people want to get hired by a publishing company is that way you can concentrate on the creative side and have another boss who's responsible for you getting stuff done. Well, when you're the self-publisher, you're the one who has to get the stuff done. You have to be the boss. And being a boss is never fun. You can't call in sick when you're the boss because everybody slacks off and the boss doesn't call in. Oh, wait, you are the boss. So it's not fun. But... It's a lot, the rewards are great. It means you 
were the captain of your own ship, the master of your own soul, and you made something that speaks to you and to other people and is a beautiful work of art that you're responsible for. It's not easy, but if we can keep everything managed, I believe you can do it. Uh, yeah, when you're asking for editors and such, um, anything worth its while, you have to pay for. I'm sorry, little Yanatos, but asking your friends to read something uh, for you, uh, they'll... Griffin, how, uh, how pessimistic should I be? Uh, you go easy on them. <laughs> okay. I mean, they're nice enough to read it, but they're not professionals. They're probably not going to see a lot of mistakes. They're not going to read it as carefully. Uh, this is probably the reason why a lot of like professional stuff does, is, isn't getting the level of editing it really needs. Plus, also, there's some professional stuff out there. Like, I don't know, maybe your favorite dungeoning game about finding paths that may not have had the best oversight working on it either so once again do your best and if you want to hire professional editors there are professional editing services you can budget for that and put that in the money but um you know any skill you don't have you're gonna have to pay money for volunteers are very difficult to work with they're not being paid so, you know, they're not necessarily going to meet your deadlines. There's no quality assurance because they're volunteers. People who actually have skills for this would actually charge for this. So this is where you have to make some decisions. Um, yes, Mr. Recycler, your mom thinks you're great. So then, uh, do we still use the phrase heartbreaker? Have you heard heartbreaker before, Griffin? Uh, I think so, yes. Yeah, that heartbreaker, uh, a heartbreaker is some project that obviously looks like someone put a lot of love into it, but it's still terrible. And so just because, uh, you know, like you need to be, I, I have courage. You need to have some courage and a thicker skin for this. Just because your mom really likes something or your friends really like something, when you put it up there for sale, uh, you know, other people, as soon as you sell it in a marketplace for money, then you are in the, you know, the critical sphere and people like justified uh, reviewing you. I think, Rafferty, you could probably attest, too, that uh, negative feedback comes a lot more freely than positive feedback. Yes. Uh, uh, in fact, um, I'm glad we got on the feedback track here. Um, I usually at least use the two apples rule on feedback, which is if one person complains about something, it, what, you know, people complain. If two people complain about something, that's usually something you have to address. Also, you're a person. So if I'm making something and I'm not happy with it, and I send it out to five editors and one other editor is happy with it. That's two people. Plus, another thing you have to worry about when you're making games is the stuff people don't complain about. Uh, it, it is a, it ha You've probably played some tabletop game, and there was some rule in the book that just didn't make any sense to you or any of your friends. And you had to go get on Board Game Geek or Reddit and read the forums to figure out what the crummy heck this rule meant. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, this is a professional game design company. How did they miss this? I mean, we're having this problem, and other people are having this problem. Well, what probably happened is because those guys were all working together on the game, and they all know each other, and they all speak the same language, use the same jargon, they felt it, it just worked for them. No one asked. As a, uh indie person, it's going to be difficult for you to get a large quality assurance pool. It's going to be difficult to get a lot of people. You can spot for that kind of stuff, and you should be like listen. You should listen to people and about the stuff. But that's a professional skill you have to inculcate. Once again, I'm gonna say, look, get your stuff out there. It's not gonna be perfect. You can but get it out there. Be be good about it. Be honest about it. And listen to people. Um, got another question. Yes, yeah, say... LLC. Yeah. Um... Uh, or more fully, as a designer, is your business structured LLC? Oh, am I an LLC? Yes, I am. I'm glad you asked me about business. Um, so I am a limited liability corporation. Setting up, uh, and what that is for folks who might not know, in the United States, you can, um, uh, with the state that you're in, um, set up a fee so you have a business that other people invest money in and get shares. Uh, you may have seen people talking about shares and some open source products, but limited liability corporation is that. Some other people have invested. You can see their names in the credits of the books that we make. Um, I'm one of the investors. And that way, the corporation owns everything. Iron Claw is made by Sanguine Productions, LLC, doing business with Sanguine Games. So we have a company for that. If this is your first product, I'm not going to recommend that you set up an LLC because corporations are different in every state. 
If you want to set one up in California, not you have to have a business address and it's got to be posted in a public newspaper for two weeks. If you want to set one up in Florida, you have to assign it to a specific address of property that you own. You can't rent. You have to own specific property to have it tied to, et cetera, et cetera. Setting up a corporation in each individual state is difficult. Why? Well, um, and it's, it's, it's all over the place. And if you're like in Europe or another uh, or, you know, some other place far removed from the U.S., like I can't even imagine. So a corporation can be good if you're in this for the long haul that we're demonstrating here on the presentation. If you want to do this for two, three or five years, you might want to go ahead and set one up. If you're, but if you're a person in the U.S. who just wants to make one game, or you just want to sell a couple novels on Amazon Prime or whatever, it's and if you're doing all the stuff yourself, you're better off making contracts with all the people involved, saying they'll be over this certain time frame for this specific product. Maybe sharing the revenue on that particular product. We'll say, look, we'll say, share ten percent for the next five years, and then after five years, the contract expires and we renegotiate. Don't feel like you have to set up a corporation unless you're serious. Like if you want to do this professionally and serious, go ahead. Otherwise, you're spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars uh, on legal issues and other admin that isn't going into your product. And like, what are you making? Are you just making a pamphlet? Uh, so we have a question here. Um, Two states, Nevada and Delaware. I know people incorporate in Delaware because they have better tax rates. Uh, I'm guessing Nevada does too. These vary state by state. You'll have to look at the rules of residency. It's it's all over the place. Uh, I know South Carolina has the best uh, credit card. Well, sorry, has the most ridiculous lack of restrictions on credit cards, which is why all your bills from credit cards come uh, Ron Akrosky says, as for rules and editing, do you think having a fact on a website or place to interact with people? Yes, you have to have those. Uh, you, I'm, I, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I sit down with a board gamer and we're about to play one of those big, nice, expensive board games, they all whip out their phones and immediately have some sort of PDF they downloaded from some site that has the correct interpretation of the rules. So I'm pretty sure, uh, that's, uh, happened to, you know, to you guys if you've done that. So yes, uh, I maintain, uh, we maintain a Reddit, uh, we maintain a bulletin board service, but, uh, and well, we used to, and uh, we have a Discord, so we can go ahead and answer some of the questions. When we talk about marketing here in a little bit, you definitely want to have a web presence. Uh, yeah, wave paper. All right. So in fact, let's talk about marketing. Uh, I wish I had nice things to say about marketing, but we've been doing this for about 20 years, and a lot of what I'm showing you here uh it is well it's not ideal okay so obviously when you make a product you want to tell people about it uh, i recommend that what you need to do is uh, maybe not incorporate but set up a separate social media profile for your product get a custom twitter id they're free even if it's a word salad it's still better than your own get a custom email address get yourself a website you can get yourself a wordpress or something like that um with contact information on it, but set all that information up separate from you. Don't use your personal information because once your personal information gets tied in with your company information, they can't be separated. Also, if your company gets into any trouble, like maybe you made a board game and someone didn't like it, so they report you for hate speech or something. I mean, you know, total like fraudulent charges, but that means that anything that happens to your business account overlaps with your personal one. So if your business gets shut down, then your personal gets shut down. And if you lost your personal email and Facebook and Twitter, that might be a big deal. Likewise, it's the other way around. If you're using your personal stuff for that, that means people can hassle you on your personal stuff. Um, I don't want to get too much into detail, but you may have seen some of the drama in the gaming community where people were using their personal uh, contact info, talking about business stuff. And then you, you can't retreat. If your personal stuff is tied up with your business, you can't take a breather and walk away. It's all business now. Set them up separately. I'm on a Windows machine and I log in separately to different accounts. I don't even let them mix at all because there's a tendency for Facebook to notice I'm logged in as my personal and start getting tied together. Keep those separate. Uh, you're going to say, uh, you might have to keep track of two or three login profiles, but trust me on this. If they get stuck together, don't be part of that drama. You don't want to be part of that. 
Um, also, when telling folks about it, I recommend going to um, uh, Griffin. Help me out here. Didn't there used to be like gatherings of large numbers of people at like stadiums and stuff to get together? What was that? What, what was that uh, called? Good, good. Uh, convening, perhaps. There we go. Convention. Convening. Eventually, this will pass, <laughs> and conventions will start again. I miss all of you. I especially love Gen Con's indie track. Uh, Gen Con is an excellent independent publishers track like a room it's devoted to print on demand people are there pacific digital is very there backer kid has a table uh print ninja has a table they'll, they'll all be there to be able to talk to you directly stumping at conventions is great running demonstrations of your game is great to do all that hachi is recommending last pass or a password manager if you want to get one of those managing clients i recommend that um the subject of advertising and third party is going to be a little uh thorny here because um uh, advertising isn't as friendly as it used to be. There used to be a lot of alternatives and you could go ahead and buy stuff like Project Wonderful uh, and 100 and that sort of thing. Not as much anymore. And I want to talk a little bit about third-party sites like BackerKit. Okay, so I've met a lot of people who are using uh, third-party upsellers like BackerKit. You may have backed a project that had BackerKit come in later. Uh, BackerKit's promising to help you out with a lot of the details of managing the crowdfunding. Uh, and they'll also promise that they'll go ahead and help you with the selling. Like they'll actually take out advertisements for you and contact other folks and go ahead and upsell. However, uh, these third-party guys like BackerKit charge a lot of money. BackerKit starts at 7% and the advertise if they advertise for you, they could take 33% or more of your Kickstarter home. We're talking like if you made $10,000 in your Kickstarter they would walk away with 3,800 of it, leaving you with like, you know, le less than two thirds to make your whole product. So um, it might, you know, maybe they'll go ahead and help upsell you for it, but they'll take huge chunks. So that raises your distribution, you know, huge. We're not talking about just the 10% from Kickstarter and then like 35% to crowd, you know, to the crowdfund, to just back or get, and all they're doing is offering to sell product for you on their website where they get a cut, or they're offering to collect the data for you. Which honestly, Indiegogo and Kickstarter already collect the data for you. Uh, these third-party guys, I've looked into it. These third-party guys do not set you up with distribution networks. They do not warehouse things for you. Uh, uh, if they take out any advertising for you, they bill you for it later. So they're not doing any of those services. So I'm not a big fan of these. I know some people are, uh, but uh, to be honest, like when I talked about responsible budgeting, uh, you you know, sure you might get ten thousand dollars, but if three thousand or four thousand that disappeared just for uh, a third party, I'm not really sure what you got out of your money. Uh, thoughts on a censored word? Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, Hachibushu has a question. I noticed you said before 15%, but they're taking a lot more. Is there upsell in their products and the minimum that we can use? Um, I could not get concrete information. Uh, I have I have not used a third party. I've talked to them about the costs that are involved. Um, I couldn't get any guarantees. Uh, from what I could get, uh, like speculatively, like when I asked, could you guarantee that I would get a 50% upsell. Obviously, none of the third parties I talked to said they could guarantee that. So, um, uh, let's see. Thoughts on GameFound. Uh, I have, thank you, Dialone. I have not heard of GameFound. I will look into those. Uh, we've used Indiegogo, Kickstarter, and if some of you have as much gray hair as I do, we've used Fundable, uh, which has been gone for a while. They were the ones we used back in 2003. I have not used GameFound, so I will look into that. Uh, and, and let you know. Thanks. I think you got one listed here also. Wondermark? Or is that a later link? Oh, that's this one. Hey, here we go. Time to link. It. Okay. So, uh, and game on tabletop. All right. Well, we're going to have to go through the, the look on this. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, folks. I've been doing this for 20 years, but I'm learning new stuff all the time. These are new crowdfunding or, or backer kit services I've never heard of before. So I'll take a look into that. Backer kit's a trademark. My bad. Okay, so also about social media. So a lot of times people would say, well, if I just get on Twitter or if I get on Facebook, I can go ahead and tell people uh, about my product and they'll hear about it. I have a little bad news for you, so don't let this get you down. Algorithms. You are going to be algorithmed. As in, you are not going to show up on people's timelines or walls. If you get too popular, 
this thing happens. Uh, David Melke of Wondermark, if you've heard of him, was nice enough to share this to me. Uh, which is, if like this usually doesn't happen if you have a personal account, you don't see this. Some of you may have gotten emails saying, why don't you get Twitter for business? After you get so popular and start showing up on so many timelines, these companies do a shakedown like I show you right here. Like literally, if you notice in the fine print here, they are telling David Malky, you will not show up on more than 200 web pages today unless you pay us money. And so this is an actual shakedown. David Malky said he thinks it's worth it, but that's why I'm going to mention you as a small fry person. Yes, you should go ahead and get a Twitter and a Facebook and, and advertise there, but advertising is going to cost you money. These All of the social media sites, the big ones, are set up that you will stop showing up on their social media after a certain point, and they will ask you for money, and they make it this easy. So just be ready for that. That's why I'm saying you might want to keep your goal low, lean on the crowdfunding for a lot of your marketing because you know those people will buy something, and for every one of those people who bought something, there might be four more later on. Stay to that kind of modest. That can give you an idea of whether it's worth your while to go ahead and back this. A lot of times uh, when uh, we talk about advertising, like you guys asked about whether I'm a teacher or not, I used to teach internet marketing. They talk about the click-through percentage, which is for every like 100 people who see the ad, maybe five in 100, maybe will click on it and uh, go ahead and at least look at your product. And out of that, you know, maybe 10 to 20% of them, like 1% or less of the total, uh, total people looking at it, the impressions, are actually going to buy it. Uh, you can buy advertising on Google and some places like that pretty cheap. Uh, Google has an AdSense feature, which has a credit card. You need to make sure that you cap it per day. You have to have a credit. First, you have to have a credit card. And secondly, you need to cap how much money you're willing to spend. Because we, when we've advertised on Google, we go through hundreds of dollars in seconds. Uh, we've gotten about a 5% return from Google, like click-throughs, where if we advertised on Google, 5% came back. A lot of these other places that I've, that I've talked to, um, by the way, if you're like feeling lonely and want to make more friends, start a crowdfunding. People start coming out of nowhere and emailing you when you start a crowdfunding. A lot of these other places that I talked to, even after they were going to take 15, 20, or 30% of our money, we're still only promising us a 5% return. You can get a 5% return just by giving it to Facebook. So, yeah, I won't say I'm being generous. Google's been pretty good about giving us a 5% return when we bought them directly, but you're right, it's a lot lower than that. I don't recommend spending a lot of your money on advertising. Uh, crowdfunding, especially through Kickstarter and word of mouth, can be very powerful for you. Advertising turns into a big uh, uh, sticky ball where the you have to start spending more money to get bigger returns, and that's where those companies like Square Enix get in trouble. Because they say like, okay, you know, we might be able to move $2 million of Tomb Raider, but what if we spent $200 million on advertising and doubled that number? Wouldn't that be great? And it's like, on the one hand, yes, you get bigger numbers. On the other hand, you just spent $200 million. There's a lot of movies that came out in the last decade that even though they had huge box office numbers, because they spent so much money on, on marketing, I mean, that's a whole other sticky ball. But it was like, yeah, it's just... You know, you know, oh no, we lost money because you spent it on marketing. Okay, you're a small indie person. Uh, you don't have a lot of money to spend. Concentrate on making your thing and making it responsibly and covering your own costs. And then maybe you can be like our, you know, you probably won't be our next Toby Fox, but maybe. Okay, Penguiner says, you're not going to crowdfund, does it still apply? Like if I just put on drive through social media and let it ride? Uh, you can do that. Uh, you could also decide, uh, uh, Peng, to make uh, like a, a certain decision. Like you might say half the money that comes in for my pamphlet, I will spend on advertising. So like, you know, so if you made like a hundred bucks, you might say, I'll spend 50 bucks and buy a Google ad. Sure. Why not? I mean, sure. It'll only show up on a couple thousand machines, but maybe it will pay off. Also, I want to give a shout out to the guys at One Bookshelf. Uh, the longer you are on drive through and the longer you're there, you earn promotion points the more titles you sell and the more people look at them they give you points which you can then spend uh on drive through to get promoted all that deal of the day stuff or the advertising that shows up on drive through is based on that so drive through will help promote you they'll also you can spend those points to send email blasts out to people and that sort of thing 
So drive through is a very good partner for that sort of thing. And yeah, I, I, I didn't like know it. they did that kind of stuff behind the scene. I guess that's to help them like figure out uh, who to put up next as the deal of the day instead of just like randomizing it. Well, deal, deal of the day is random to opt into it, but the cost goes up the more people uh, that are opting into it. So right, it, that it, makes it's sense. It's it's to it's it's to create a nice filter. And also, the advertisements that show up there, you have to buy those. Plus, also, drive through will just do random promotions like Christmas in July, where everybody gets a discount. Okay, Ashbushi says, be wary of going to communities, just advertise. Yeah, um, okay, so EN World is very provincial about this, uh, where EN World won't even let you in uh, if it's, uh, yeah. Going into a random community and saying, hey, guys, I've got a thing here. Nowadays, people are a lot cooler about it. Look for a place that's called promotion or self-promotion or plugs. Uh, look for that section and and go ahead and promote it there. If they don't have a section like that, like Hachibushi was warning us about here, don't just assume you can just show in and uh, show up and talk about something. Um, you know, also uh, learn where you are before you're going somewhere. Like, you know, like you should uh, advertise stuff. But you might want to also be active in social media. A lot of places like EN World want you to talk a lot uh, about kind of stuff. That's why I recommend stick to your own social media and promote your own stuff and your, like, get your own Twitter, your own webpage, your own Facebook and promote it there. Uh, yeah, Mystery Cycle, they have the badges that marks how many you sold. It's nice, but don't go by that because there's rule, not every, not all your sales go there. Like, none of my Kickstarter sales count towards that. So, um, uh, it's nice that you're in the category, but a lot of places, a lot of titles are actually selling way better than their medals would let you believe. So now we're talking about making your budget. So we have a lot of things we have to worry about here in our budget. For example, we talked about we have the fixed costs. We have to pay. Uh, we have to pay our freelancers. We have to pay the talent. Uh, the crowdfunding is going to. Uh, the crowdfunding is going to want a specific piece of our entire budget. Uh, and if you're dealing with third parties, they're going to want a piece. Uh, per unit costs are things that go up for the number of people. Like fixed cost, if you get ten grand from your Kickstarter, eleven percent of that, like you don't even see. That goes to credit card fees and Kickstarter's pocket. So out of ten grand, you'd only take less than uh, nine grand home. That's fixed. So if your budget was ten grand, you'd only see nine. But per unit is if you're going to make these units that are cost eighty bucks each to make these box games, then the more people who pledge, the more that goes up. That's the warning zone I told you about. And don't forget that the more units you move, the more your distribution costs go up. Then at the end here, we're going to have to ask for a profit margin. Yes, you want a profit margin and you want it to be positive because uh, you actually want to make money on sales. If you're losing money on sale, if, 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 this is, if this is negative, then you're losing money on sales. And that means that you might make a Kickstarter and get all the money, but delivering on it would actually cost you more money out of pocket and that's where a lot of these guys get into trouble. You also want a profit margin because you don't want it to be zero because then your morale is going to get really low because you're working really hard to make this, but you're not necessarily getting any return on it at all. And there's that temptation that you, you for some people that, why should I deliver? I already won my Kickstarter. No, 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 no. You're supposed to deliver. Uh, let's see. Question here from Bushu. I backed one crowdfunding. Delivery was $1. Uh, you had to pay discount of one dollar to get them. Uh, you know, Hachi Bishu, I'm glad you brought that up because I wasn't going to. Uh, yeah. Um, I mentioned the medals. Like Drive Through RPG has been our partner, uh, and they're very good about this. But uh, like I said, even though Drive Through will help you deliver your Kickstarter. They don't count. Get, drive through only counts the sales if they're like a, like if they're positive, if they're a dollar more than the amounts that you're actually using. So, like I said, I've sold thousands of copies through some of my crowdfundings, but they don't show up on my metal rewards. So, some places are charging a dollar more. I think that's kind of skeevy. I think you know, honestly, you know, as much as the metals are nice. I think we, you know, I don't think people like getting hit with secondary fees. Like I'm guessing Hashibushi, you didn't like being hit with another dollar after all that happened. So, um, uh, but yeah, products have started doing that because dry, the metals don't get there and the metals are a big, uh, you know, deal. Like, uh, that's why that started happening. 
Uh, honestly, I've been using the print on demand through drive through where we will uh, give you the, digi the digital copies included with our Kickstarter, but the print copy you have to pay separate for. We started doing that because we had a problem where um, it's very difficult to set up shipping through Kickstarter. You have to guess how much it's going to cost to ship, and then you have to set it per country. And I was always getting people like a somebody from Micronesia or Luxembourg who wanted a copy shipped to them and couldn't find us in the shipping thing. And when they said they picked our generic like European community because it was $25 and they're saying it should only be 19 to ship to them, they were mad and like mad at us and not going to back our product. And I was like, Ugh. since we shifted to the system where drive through uh, does uh, our print on demand fulfilling for us and people get charged for their shipping when they order it through drive through we tell folks in advance about that. If you look at our Kickstarter rewards, though, you'll notice that we have print only and digital with option for print later because we still get people who want to do one-stop printing. But I tell them in advance, I don't know how much it's going to cost to ship to your country. That could That's going up like right now. Prices are going up right now. So we have to, like I showed with the budgeting here, we have to round up and charge more. And we're not shipping this to you at like, you know, fourth class media rate. We have to ship it to you something that we can track. Otherwise, we don't know it's there. So we have to use expensive tracking. And so we tell folks in advance. We still get pledgers for that. That's one of the example of a premium reward that we do as a courtesy. But most of our stuff we do as the print on demand. Uh, yeah, they said they were doing it up front. Hachi Bishu, once again, I, I, I would recommend here, like if you're doing, um, uh, you know, you want to make the product and you, you, you want to make it and share it with other people. These kinds of shenanigans to try and raise your metal rate. Like, I don't, you know, I, just make your thing. Uh, let's see. Magus Mandruk. I know you went past this earlier, but if you have time, give me some ideas where to source an artist from. Yeah, we'll actually have another uh, link at the end here. Do you think that using an uh, aspiring college expertise is a good idea? Uh, do you pay by piece or portfolio work for cards? Um, to go back to the contracts that we had earlier, you would specify to whoever this is, even if they're an amateur, I want this picture. I want a color. You should specify the pixel size you want because if you don't specify the pixel size, you might get something that's too small. doesn't have as much anymore, but be as specific as you want. Uh, feel free to negotiate with them, even if they're totally untried. Uh, uh, negotiate your rate up front. Some people, uh, you know, if they're in college as a design student, they had classes on business, so they should, you know, they should probably know to negotiate this. Get the contract set up, agree to the contract, agree to the deadlines, uh, and, and and then get it made. So yeah, I no, if you looking for new talent who hasn't been presented anywhere, and we'll have some links to that later, uh, is definitely uh, you know an option. Once again, don't feel remember, we don't want to exploit people. Ask them how much they're going to charge. And if that's how much they're going to charge, you don't want to spend a lot of time nickel and diming them. Uh, they're probably already discounting their rate in the bid and um it's kind of a buyer's market when it comes to our work because you can find other people but if you really want this artist negotiate an honest rate and we're crowdfunding take whatever rate they gave you put that in this budget here and ask for that in the crowdfunding either it shows up or it doesn't and be honest with your artist. say okay at the rate you quoted me i'm gonna put this in the crowdfunding if you look at the last one we did the um the book of corals which ended yesterday You'll see cameo slots of if you bid at this level, Sudir or Ebony Leopard will draw a picture for you. We asked them how much they would charge for that. We put that number in. We added the Kickstarter fee. We added the fee for the book. And there it was. And whatever they, and some artists charged more than others. We said, this is where you go in the Kickstarter. Hashibushu says, so then you have to worry about minimums for offsets, not just dollars. Yeah. Uh, basically, all the numbers have to be part of the budget. Uh, uh, in other words, the money that you asked for in the Kickstarter, the, the goal, the, the final goal, has to be enough to cover your project, maybe even more. Don't be like Molly New and say, well, if we made a little bit underneath, you know, because of the rules of Kickstarter, you know, if I, if I, if I need 10000 I should ask for 5000 because I might not get 10000 No, no, if you need 10000 ask for 10000 it's always better to go higher. You may have noticed a lot of our Kickstarters start at really low goals, like 2,000 or 3,000, and eventually get to 10K or 15K. It's like, yeah, I mean, I'm much happier with 15K for production. We'll get a much better deal out of it, but we could have made it for the lower money. So we're just being honest here. We just made a bigger book. And if this is your first project, you know, we, we need to be responsible with that. It's going to be something you can actually do. 
Okay, so this is an example of what all those budgets might look like. Like I said, your total budget is going to be, um, you know, to cover all of that, the, the fixed costs plus unit sales times what you're going to sell it for. And then we have to figure out how much, you know, of the slices. This is a way to figure out how many units that we were going to sell for our budget. If you only wanted to sell 100 units, you would ask for a less money than if you were going to go ahead and sell 1,000 units. Uh, Explose, XP Love Cat, what is the average profit margin we should expect when self-publishing? That's a very good question and has a very long answer. As uh, much as you can get. <laughs> well, no, because you don't want to ask for too much money. You don't want to be profiteering. Anyway, Griffin, we've got the biggest link of all, if you could drop that in there. Yeah, I got it right here for you. Okay. This budgeting worksheet, for your convenience, is on Google Spreadsheets. You're welcome. It's got a lot of annotations on it. There's only one sample there. I've gone ahead and prepared some samples here. Uh, the answer is you want to ask for a profit margin that's positive, but not one that's going to go ahead and catapult you into a, a huge region here. For example, here is an example of something of a box game you might sell in stores. You've probably all seen like a modest $30 to $40 board game. It comes in a nice like nine inch by nine inch box. Okay, and you probably would spend like about 40 bucks on that. So when that's sold to stores and physically moved around, uh, you know, usually that's sold to stores at a wholesale rate. So if a box was sold to a brick and mortar store for, you know, and they sell it for $40, they probably got it for 20 or $16. So in order for it to meet that price, because obviously if, it, if it's a small box game and you were selling it for 80 bucks, very few people are going to buy it. It would have to have something extremely premium inside it. So therefore, because you'd have to realistically sell for about 40 bucks, your profit margin on each of these would probably only be about 20% um, about or less. So in other words, in a Kickstarter like this, I would have gotten $119,000 up front. Uh, and then uh, any that I sell through stores later on, I would go ahead and get 20, I would get like maybe six to $8 on each of those sales later after I went ahead and hit the stores. Uh, but profit margins can be much higher. Like, for example, if I was going to go ahead and make a video game uh, that I was going to sell on Steam, uh, after we went in and paid our fixed costs to get listed on Amazon or distribution, uh, those distributors usually ask for about 25%. Uh, Amazon can be as high as 50 uh, I know people have talked about, like, Epic Store having lower ones, but they have different rules. Uh, so my profit margin on something we sell digitally might be 25%. But also notice that when we sell something digitally, we charge less for it. People are willing to spend 40 or $50 for something physical. But let's face it, you're all savvy consumers. You know that digital stuff costs less to produce. So you're not going to pay the same 60 bucks. You want to pay 30 20 15 $10. So our profit margin is slightly higher on stuff like this. But also, um, you know, the, the, sale, the, the sale point is lower. You don't want to charge too much for an indie game because people aren't probably going to spend more than 10 bucks in an indie game. There's no hardcore science to this. This is just stuff you have to understand. Uh, yep, box game for direct sales. Uh, now, here, when we're like, you may have seen, like, uh, if you're old like me, you may have seen those as seen on TV. A lot of Kickstarters are going to specialize in selling direct to the customer and eliminating middlemen. They don't want to sell the brick and mortar stores. You might do a Kickstarter and say, we're only going to sell this $40 game. We're going to warehouse it in my house and then ship it to you. We're not going to sell this in brick and mortar stores. And then you might decide that as much as 56% of the product is going to be profit because that's it. You're one and done. This is all you're ever going to sell. That's not being greedy, you know, necessarily because you went through all the legwork to go ahead and make 3,000 units of this and warehouse it. And sure, you're making a much bigger return on it, but, you know, this is a smaller thing, one and done. You could have decided to take a much smaller print margin on this and mod this worksheet instead of saying $39.95, say $29.95, and have your profit margin uh, or reduce it, in, you know, to almost like 6 or 8%. That's fine. These are questions you have to answer for yourself. Are you doing this because you do want a positive return? But remember, the thinner you make that profit margin, the more danger you're in. You're, you're going to be less incentivized to sell the product because it's not making money. Uh, over time, warehousing and the, and the effort you put into selling it is going to be less. And if that profit margin ever like drops to 0% or worse, gets lower than that, you'll be losing sales on each item. 
Some of you already had horror stories about uh, crowdfundings where they didn't do the numbers right and found out they were losing sales. So they just canceled it and kept all the money. Okay, so Cryos101 says, visit my site and there's presentation. A uh, little difference. Uh, uh, Cryos, it's, the presentation that's on our site is pretty much the same one that's here. First of all, we had to translate this from uh, from Microsoft PowerPoint to Google Slides. So some of the slides are a little munged up. And I make constant little edits. Like some people came up with uh, GameFound and other things I've never heard of. So they edit it. So it's pretty much the same one that was here. Um, we have several posts about this presentation. So they're dated. So the one I did in 2018 is going to be different than the one I did in 2020. But they're pretty much the same. Um, and also, we're gonna we have uh, uh, we post videos of this. So yeah, if uh, you've already seen another some... question, if you want, uh, Penguinter, uh, what do you think oh. of the pricing structure of pay what you want? Uh, so a lot of times you'll see digital stuff on, uh, especially drive through, which is pay what you want, where you put a product up and you say like, hey, if you think this is useful to you, pay some money for it. I think those are good for experimental type stuff. It's kind of the opposite of a crowdfunding where I was going to make this anyway, but if you want to pay for it, go ahead and pay for it. Um, we here at Sanguine have mostly been using that for stuff that people asked for, but I wouldn't feel right charging for it. Like a GM screen. Uh, you know, like this is the kind of stuff that I know people ask for this sort of thing and have charts and stuff like that. But, you know, if you want to go ahead and order a printed version of that, fine but some people will like throw us like a dollar or two as a tip for that so it's uh, it's definitely nice for like add-ons like if you want to make an extra feature some of your customers that hardcore Pareto 20 percent would like to go ahead and tip you for that if it's your only product so just pay what you want you're you're in a little ambiguous area because if it's pay what you want you didn't you might not get any money for it so you might be doing this as just an experiment for your own effort but People, if you put it up as pay what you want, you're going to get people criticizing you like it was merchandise for sale. We're back into that macaroni art argument we had earlier where it's one thing when you're showing it off to uh, your parents on your fridge and to your friends. It's another thing when you put it in a marketplace. Even at pay what you want, you're going to get that kind of stuff. So I would recommend using pay what you want for extra add-ons that, you know, as courtesies that people ask for. Or if you really want to do something experimental, like, hey, I've got some idea here for sorcerer type add-ons, and I'm not sure about it, maybe do that as pay what you want. As your core model for making your merchandise, we're, for our presentation here, we're talking about if you want to get professionals, professional artwork, professional writers, and get in bookstores, then uh, we're talking about getting some capital up front. Um, to be honest, do whatever help, uh, speaks to you. If you just want to do a modest pamphlet and share it with other people, go for it. Um, uh, I always love seeing more stuff from people. So as you can see here, we have lots of different examples uh, of stuff. Like for example, I have here, what if we wanted to make 3000 units uh, for $40 and uh, you know, make a really nice box game with color stuff, but, but no one's heard of me. So I'm like, I get $119,000 so no one's heard of. What if we decided to go with, you know, like instead of wooden pieces, what if we went with counters? Uh, what if instead of a color rule book, we would have a black and white rule book? What if we scaled it down from like 200 custom cards to maybe 100 cards and sell them to someone later? What if we can control the cost and get it down to where we can make a thousand of these for $20 each? You know, like recently we did a, a Horror Stories, which is our first box game, which is a cute little uh, storytelling card game. That what we I would love to making huge, big, fancy box games, but we decided to we toned it down to something a little more modest than this. Once again, if this is your first product, as exciting as it would be to make something that's huge box or a video game, 50 hours of voice acting or that kind of thing. If this is your first product, you might want to scale it down a little bit. What's reasonable for you or sort of responsible for you to work with? What's in your actionable skill set? What are measurable numbers that won't destroy you? Go ahead and uh, keep it something a uh, little modest that you can control. Uh, I don't think we have that much of the graphic novel here. Um, nowadays, if you want to write fiction, uh, Amazon Prime is really good. Speaking of our website, thanks, uh, Cryos. If you go to our website, and we'll have a link to drop later, uh, there are some uh, great resources for fiction writers on the internet. Uh, there's a huge market with Amazon Prime and places like that because you pay a, fat, a flat fee for Amazon Prime, and then uh, people can read as much as they want. And then uh, the 
the people who write the stories get a piece of all of that. So that set up a new market where if somebody really likes a certain kind of story, like they like, like stories about dishwasher repairmen, uh, they can read those stories a lot better and you're, you can reach your underserved market a lot better. But I think most of you came here for games. So uh, yeah, there's ebook right there. Uh, notice that on the worksheet that I sent you, some of these categories might not have any meaning to you. For example, like, you know, costs, like, uh, like, like example here for self-published ebook. If it's a prose novel that you write yourself and it's only an ebook, it has no material cost and no talent cost. You did everything yourself, so you don't have to pay anyone else. So those turn into zero. Uh, likewise, even though like the profit here might look like 70%, remember that that's 70% of 990 dollars, and that's effectively what you're paying yourself. So even though your take home from this would be something like 600 like or 700 dollars, uh, you know, for a big novel that that you know it's a question of the return. So when you when you're doing your profit models, think about how much of this budget you'd actually be taking home. Uh, the small gen in general. The smaller the budget, the larger the profit margin should be. Because if you're only getting like nine hundred or a thousand dollars, and your profit margin on this is only ten percent, that means you only got like ten or twenty bucks for doing all this work. And once again, your morale is important to me. Okay, yes, not you, you pay yourself, buy yourself. You know that nice Xbox Series X. What do they call the new one? It's a bunch of weird sound. No. Oh gosh, they just keep adding more X's to it. Okay. Just a reminder here, a couple things, uh, you know, as we're winding up here. Remember, winning a Kickstarter, getting the crowdfunding, that's not success. Delivering the final product is success. Uh, I know it's very stressful to go through the crowdfunding process and wait for all the money to show up. But after that money shows up, you are responsible for delivering the thing. That's why we talked about responsible business practices today. You know, nice agile structure, get milestones, manage it out, break it down to small things. Ask for the money that you need so you have a good safety zone. Uh, get contracts with your uh, talent and pay them how much they're worth. If you lowball or volunteer talent, they might disappear on you and then you're on the hook for that. So get contracts and pay them what they asked for. Once you've got all that, make your thing. I believe in you. So uh, a couple other things. We talked about quality assurance. You may want to hire an editor, but just be responsible about it. Don't rush your project uh, in. Uh, sometimes you can also do early access programs where we've delivered the digital version to folks early. Sometimes they comment on it. And most of the time they don't. I've done early access programs in the past. I didn't get a lot. Penguinter asks, do you have a standard practice for copyright or trademark? Uh, in the U United States, the mere act of publishing it gives you copyright. So once you've made the material and traded it anyway, even digitally, you are the owner of the text that's in it and other people can't copy it. Registering a trademark is going through a process of paying money to the US government to tell them, I own Mickey Mouse or tapping a card is a patented process. No one else can talk about tapping a card and turning it 90 degrees. Those sorts of things are legal things you have to pay for separately. If this is your first product, I would recommend you don't really need this stuff. You're already covered by copyright with the mere act of publishing it. Trademarking is when you have stuff like, you know, like Iron Claw or Storyteller or Werewolf the Apocalypse that you want to make sure no one else can publish your product with that name. And I would worry about trademarking once you get big. Right now, we're talking about your first one. I think trademarking also applies that as long as you have sold or traded it under that name, it's still valid. And as long as you defend that name legally, you keep it. Uh, right, but you still have to, re you still have to, research. you have to. You, you have to register a trademark. Copyright is free. Trademark is money. Okay. Um, also, this might not happen to you. Get a lawyer's business card. This this doesn't happen as much as it used to, but every now and then we get angry people writing to me saying, hey, I was going to make a furry role-playing game. You obviously stole my idea. Um, so, um, you know, like, they'll just write me out of the blue. It's like, I don't know who this guy is. And, like, also... Remember I said, like, actually making something is what you're supposed to do? People, like, you know, were sitting on their own ideas, their fault, whatever. You'll get some sort of crazy person that will show up and claiming they want legal threats. Get yourself the, a business card of a lawyer. You don't necessarily have to have hired them, but, uh, like, if it's a family lawyer or something like that, just get the card. And if anyone ever writes any message to you threatening legal action anyway, give them the address and the card and say, this is my lawyer. Contact them. 
and then immediately block that person. Block them on everything, never talk to them again. Uh, those people will disappear. Uh, maybe they might contact the lawyer and then that lawyer would contact you saying, apparently I represent you now. Even if they weren't the kind of lawyer, they would refer you another one. But honestly, you should do that. Do not get in fights with people over the internet over this stuff. It will sap your energy. And honestly, it could get you in legal trouble later if the person pr proves to be crazy enough to want to go ahead and get a um, uh, and get some sort of legal stuff. If they do it, just block them out of sight, out of mind. Usually these people are just making noise. Okay, a couple of questions here. Contra, when is a good time to start your crowdfunding campaign? Should you be in mid-development of your product? Uh, Contra, you want to have something to show on your crowdfunding. So when people look at your crowdfunding, you have to have something to show them on the website. Having an early access or, I don't know, pay what you want, early draft version, uh, available for people to look at can give them a lot, a lot. Especially releasing an early first edition and then telling people I want to update to a second edition, that will get you a lot more. Because people like your early thing and saying, okay, I'm going to do the same Apocalypse World thing, but I'm going to do it with like art now. And people say, art? We like art? Sure. You can get all... So if you already have something to show off, it's a lot better. If you don't have anything to show off, a Kickstarter page needs something on it. You may, if you look at ours, you'll see we have artwork on them. We're often promoting like Iron Claw stuff, which we already did. But if it was something new like Vital Hearts, we went ahead and got some video and some graphics and went ahead and put those up there. So you'll need something to show. Honestly, if you're the type of creative person that I think you are, you probably already have a rough draft. So making an early rough draft available and, tell, and pitching your Kickstarter as, I want to do this, but better, then you can have a lot to show off to people. Okay, Mystery Cycle asks, I want to publish an adventure or some of someone else's RPG. Uh, if they don't have an OGL document. Okay, if they if another company doesn't have an open gaming license, then you will have to license. You must write to them and ask them what would be your terms for publishing under your thing. Some guys will say, you know, just go ahead and do it. Uh, whatever you decide, get a contract. Get it in writing. Some companies, uh, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk smack about TriStat because they don't exist anymore. TriStat had incredible draconian terms for uh, licensing stuff. And for a while, Dungeons & Dragons wasn't using OGL. You may have noticed 4th edition didn't use OGL. 3rd and 5 do, the 4th didn't. Um, also, some other folks might be worried about uh, their quality control. Like you may have noticed that uh, way back in the 2000s, people started making porn add-ons for Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, the D&D guys want, you know, like Asbro didn't want to get associated with that. But technically anything that was under OGL, they couldn't stop people from that. So notice they kept their D20 and DMs Guild branding separate from that other thing. In other words, they wanted quality control. They didn't want their product being associated with the next fatal RPG that was on the market. So if you want to make something for someone else's rules and it's not OGL, you need to go ahead and get that uh, in writing. Um, the kind of dubious zone here is Powered by the Apocalypse, which a lot of people are writing for. But apparently, uh, speaking of what Griffin said earlier about defending your copyright, Powered by the Apocalypse has uh, shown that the people who created it were not defending the copyright. So um, uh, it Powered by the Apocalypse isn't really OGL. But, man, this just gets to a big uh, sticky ball, doesn't it? Because Apocalypse World isn't, but Dungeon World has an OGL. That they're with. If you want to write for someone else and they don't have an open gaming license, get a contract. Uh, yeah, Ashibushu says, have your thing done. So I mentioned get a business card, anyone, lawyer stuff. Once again, treat everybody right. It's okay to negotiate pricing with folks, but honestly... Like freelancers are probably already lowballing their stuff. It's a buyer's market for that kind of stuff. And if you're gonna try and nickel and dime the freelancers, you're even you're you're gonna get you want the best work possible. If you try to get people to do it on the cheap, you're gonna get cheap work. Ask them for how much they want and then put that in your crowdfunding. Um, and like I said, always after you do all this budgeting worksheet, you might want to raise the numbers a little bit more. It's better to have a little safety money because it will sap your morals. You know, so your your morale, if, I mean, your morale might go down, then your morals. Uh, it will sap your morale if you're working for nothing or less than nothing. Uh, if you can, have a credit card with emergency fund. I know it's a weird thing to say in 2020. Okay, uh, Griffin, we've got a lot more links to drop here.
Ah, uh, here so, they come. Okay, so these are other places to look at. Like I said, Backer Kit might get something for you. I'm not necessarily recommending them, but people do. Uh, emyth.com is one of my favorite websites. Emyth is the entrepreneur myth. The ideal was the easy part. Someone said earlier, you're going to have to wear the manager hat and you're going to have to be a manager for this. Emyth, they sell books, but they also have free materials that are very good about helping you through that long darkness of the soul uh, to encourage you to go ahead and make your own business. Can't recommend Emyth enough. Uh, Intuit are the guys who make TurboTax and Quicken. Their software can be very helpful for tracking your budget if you're not a database nerd like me. Lightning Source and Lulu are print-on-demand places. You can go directly to them and ask for bids. We have worked with them for many years. They've been very helpful. Uh, Print Ninja as well. Print Ninja have been very informative. I love seeing them at the shows. One Bookshelf is the trade name for the drive through Comics and drive through RPG Network. We've already said very nice things about them. The Game Crafter is an example of a place that makes prototype games out of pre-made materials. They're not the nicest, but you can use them for prototyping. They're also very expensive, but once again, prototyping. And there's always a link to the the 10 points, which is a humorous article on game design that I also like reading uh, because, hey, another Emith fan. And uh, yeah, Run Across Gay says doesn't submit a ticket. I think this event was free so because um, it's in the university track. Uh, so... Um, yeah, so that's um, basically the entire panel. Uh, we went. Did we go slightly over? No, we're still five minutes under. Yeah. So we're yeah, still if, you, good. if you've got any more questions, uh, we had some of this stuff on the website as uh, Child Zero Zero One or whatever it's pronounced saw earlier. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, it's stuff on our website, and we'll be posting uh, some of this video later. But like I said, we cover we it, every year it gets slightly differently. Uh, yeah, you can go to the website. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, like I said, I really, maybe next year when we do this panel again, we can see you at uh, um, Gen Con University or that sort of thing. Uh, any last minute questions before we wound up? Or um, yeah, I, I do appreciate if you submit your e-ticket to let people know. Uh, this event is usually one, one of our most popular ones, and I also love hearing from you because I learned a few new things today, and I love hearing uh, what uh, things people are going to make. And like I said, you've got links to our materials. And while we wait to see if there's a couple more questions, uh, hey, thanks everyone for coming. We're glad to see you all here, and you've been a wonderful bunch, too. Uh, Griffin, you're better. You uh, Can you make uh, Discord invites? We, ha we have an official Sanguine Discord. I'll go ahead and post that in the event. I don't want to flip out of this because this setup is very fragile and tends to break. Uh, they... Let me see if I can do that. Uh, uh, do. We will most likely update the slideshow. The slideshow link that's already on the website is nearly identical to this one. I, I think I made at most minor changes. That's... Also, during the chat, Griffin dropped a lot of the links in the chat. So, uh, um, uh, a lot of that stuff. So, yeah. And also, like, I apologize in advance, but when we load it up to Google Slideshow, these get mangled a little bit. Uh, but, I regret uh, to inform you, Raph, that uh, I cannot get links to your server. You probably need to, like, make some permalink at some point. Okay, well... Uh, I'll go ahead and link folks uh, in, in there about that. But yeah, no, we've made a lot of mistakes and I've met other people who have made mistakes. And uh, like I said, I believe in you. I believe in this cat. Sorry to people. Yeah, there we go. He doesn't believe in you, but I do. <laughs> okay. So we hope to see you all uh, next year. Good luck. Feel free to write to us. Drop us a line in the Discord. Love to hear from you and uh, you know, best of success. Uh, and yeah, Dialone Games, if you want to take this moment in our chat right here, or Twitch chat, go ahead and link whatever you want. Uh, I'll even advertise our, ourselves to wrap this up. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Griffin. Uh, I stream on this channel with our uh, actual host, Ractus, who's uh, busy elsewhere, but I'm handling that for today. We stream on Sundays and Wednesdays, and we do a lot of tabletop RPGs. If you just like to see us play things that uh, and goof off, Come on and join us. We play for 12 hours on Sundays and Wednesdays. We have a whole bunch of different things coming on, and uh, we publish it all on YouTube as well, under the same name. So I hope you guys all like that. And uh, I believe once uh, we get all that out of the way, uh, I guess this is it then. So thank you all again for coming. And Rafferty, any last words? Um, Like, share, and subscribe. Yeah, yeah, like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> all right. Uh, end the stream. Catch you all later.